Hello everyone. Happy, uh, what day is today? Tuesday. For everyone who's watching in real time. Otherwise, if you're watching recorded, happy whatever day it is when you are watching this. It's good to see everyone. Uh, it turns out I need a haircut because it seems to be a little out of control. I will make a note of that uh, and take care of that later this week. Um, welcome to my new office. It's a little different than the old office. I don't have anything on the wall. Those things were already here when I got here. Um, so I've got a big bookshelf over here that you can't see. Um, so that's exciting uh, for me. And, um, and you guys can watch the progress as I add stuff to the back wall. So maybe I'll put some interesting things back there. Or maybe not. I've been kind of thinking that maybe I'll keep it kind of, kind of flat. I don't know. Um, we'll see. Let me know what you think. Send me an email or something if you have an, a strong feeling about it one way or the other. Anyway, let's get started here with um, some questions. I've got some good stuff for us today and we'll just get started. All right, first question comes from Ashley Letourneau. Uh, any advice on developing a product line? I own a cleaning company and had an opportunity to create eco-friendly cleaning products. I have no idea what to expect or what to plan for. Looking for any generic advice. Cool, all right, so we're talking about a product line um, and the steps to go into developing it. So first I would say um, know your audience know why you're developing it, right? Like it's like one thing to just develop a product line because you want to have a product line, but um, who your audience, why are you, um, my, these glasses are very reflective. Um, why are you doing it? So know your audience, know your market, um, do some market research, talk to people who you'd be selling to, figure out how you would be selling to them. Um, nothing sucks more than to spend a lot of time working on um, building out a product or a new business or whatever it is, only to have, yay, it's ready, and nobody cares. Um, I've been guilty of that at times in the past, and so um, my recommendation is to make sure that you focus on um, building your, uh, your market and knowing how you're gonna speak to these people and how you're gonna sell to these people, and what problem are you solving? Because if you're not solving a problem, then, um, you know, the, like how's it different? It would be all questions to ask at the top of that process. And then of course, don't forget the financial sides of all this. Um, you know, calculating, you know, what's my sales and marketing process going to cost me? What's my product going to, you know, what is that gonna cost? What do my margins look like? Um, and is there any money in this? Um, you know, sometimes people build really great things that are just um, too expensive for the market that they serve. And, um, you know, I actually have a friend who was in the um, nitro glove business um, and he, he sold a really high quality, environmentally friendly produced nitro glove. Um, and it was always a real struggle for him. Um, but then the market shifted and then like for last year, he just like made tons of money because of um, COVID. So um, that was an example of where he didn't really fit the market exactly really to really compete with you know, the cheaper um, end ones and his environmental stuff was a good story, but it didn't really like, at the end of the day, people were still basing their money, their decisions on price. Um, and, but then the market shifted. And then of course, at that point, there was just so much demand, it didn't matter. Um, and the prices all came up to meet him anyway. So, um, so yeah, know your market, know who you're focusing on. Don't worry about just, don't make a product just to make a product. Um, do your research. Next question, Kimberly Vincent. What strategy of ideas would you recommend we do to have HR and team leaders send their employees to our clinic and our associate clinics, clinics on a regular basis once they have signed up for our corporate massage therapy program? We have a new corporate massage program that targets mid-sized and large companies. We help decrease soft tissue pain and stress of employees, creating improved productivity and happier employees. We connect companies with massage therapy clinics and maintain a fee for doing so. We also do virtual one-on-ones for employees, webinars for large teams to educate employees about stress and soft tissue prevention and treatments. Um, all right, some ideas about this, uh, Kim. And I know we've talked about this quite a bit before, and so I wanna throw some, uh, some thoughts out there. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about when I saw this question was um, how do we get the 
the employees who are the first early adopters to talk it up? And I don't necessarily have an answer to this. I just have like a thought process and then we can kind of fill in the blanks, hopefully. Um, we do have some employees that immediately are early adopters and are happy to jump in. Um, and then they, um, so how do we, well, how do we use them in some way, right? Like instead of trying to push everything from the top down, we, we've been talking to like the HR bosses and the people who are gonna be like the, you know, company people, get the employees to do it. But if we've got two or three or four or five, whatever it is, employees who are, who are utilizing it, how do we feed it back up? Maybe that's kind of a thought process that we haven't explored at all yet. Um, you know, so how do we how do we get them to um, to tell their buddies about it at their workplace, or how do we get them to promote it um, back up the food chain? It's an interesting thought. We hadn't talked about it at all that way. Um, like I said, I don't have any answers exactly, but I think that's an interesting thought, and that goes for anybody who's trying to accomplish some sort of um, um, result, like trying to get people to do something. Um, you know, there's, it's always top down or bottom up, however you want to um, approach it. And sometimes those are two very different, not sometimes, they're always two very different approaches, but sometimes the results can be drastically different depending on which one you're working on. So if one isn't working, if you're, not, if you're approaching it from this angle and it seems to be a struggle, um, you can always turn around and try to, um, you know, take a different angle on it, try to get a different group of people advocating for you than that we're advocating before. So, um, yeah, that's an interesting thought. I think we should talk more about that, Kim. Um, cool. All right. Uh, Christopher Joseph, when picking a name for a product or company, what I what a name in which Google tries to suggest something else, as in, did you mean, because there are minimal accurate results be advantageous or dis disadvantageous? We are looking to pick a name for our company and one of the options produces no results and thus Google searches for what it thinks is a better search. Is this an advantage situation in that when we register the name, we will be at the top hit because there's nothing else with that name or is a name like this disadvantageous because Google will always try to search something more relevant and this gives us little to any traffic in regards to SEO. Um, I'm not an SEO expert, but I do have a thought about this. Um, and because I, for example, um, everybody, I don't know if everybody knows, but I, um, you know, my big hot dog uh, experience um, was born out of this exact conversation. Um, we basically said, we wanna make a goofy product that we're gonna sell online um, and we're going to, um, want it to be very like P, like the PR could be built around it and we want it to be unique across the whole internet. So what we did was started Googling our ideas and if other things came up, we took those off the list. And so um, ultimately what we found was Big Hot Dog was something that was um, unique across the whole internet and BigHotDog.com, which is a kind of a generic description, which was also available as a website, um, was the website we ultimately used and there was nothing that was filled in before that, you know, that specifically was like a product or something. So um, needless to say, um, that really did work for us to fill that kind of that Google gap. Um, and so what I would imagine would happen in your particular case too, um, if you're searching for something that doesn't exist and it's suggesting something else, when there is something that does exist, again, I'm no expert, but uh, generally I think you do fill that gap. So um, you're now, now you don't automatically fill it just because you have the domain name. You still got to kind of go through the process of getting your backlinks and all that sort of stuff. But if you're utilizing the domain in a meaningful way, it doesn't take much for if people start searching for what you're offering uh, or searching for what your name is, it pops up pretty quick um, actually. Um, and all the better if whatever it is that you're doing, um, if in your name it explains what you're doing, um, that is also helpful because then people can maybe search kind of generically for something, but then your name pops up because it's the name and the generic activity is the same thing. That's been a strategy that I've seen work pretty well for people uh, when they are able to kind of link their name and what they do into one, one deal. Yeah, so I would go for the thing that's unique. I don't think it's, it's not going to, 
it's, it's not going to suggest things around you if you actually existed already. So if you found a gap, fill it. Okay, Ashley Letourneau. What is the best way to generate leads? I own a cleaning company right now. I am experimenting with Groupon and Facebook ads, wondering if there's anything else out there that I should try. Yes. Generating leads is like the number one thing that everybody struggles with um, all the time, whether you're um, like a you know, big, well-funded startup with you know, VC money behind you, or if you're just working on your own at your kitchen table, uh, creating leads is a challenge. So, um, Groupon and Facebook ads is a great place to start. Um, all the digital marketing stuff that you can do, um, it's all good. The nice thing about um, that stuff, I guess the good and the bad of it, is that if you, um, you have to track, you have to, you, you know your numbers, right? Like it's easy because you just say, all right, I spent two hours setting this up and my time's worth 50 bucks an hour, so I've got $100 worth of time setting it up. And then I spent a thousand dollars on you know these keywords and then you just basically say okay did all the conversion rates equal something greater than that eleven hundred dollars that I spent in time and money to generate the result and if the answer so you need to track that step one um, and if you're not tracking that that specifically then you need to start tracking it because otherwise you'll have no idea what's working and what's not working because odds are something will work but if you're doing kind of 10 different things in these same category and you're not tracking it closely, you're going to be, you're never going to make any money because the nine things that didn't work will just eat up any of the margin you had on the one thing that did work. You want to find the one thing that does work and then scale that thing up and let the other stuff go away. So, um, so make sure you're tracking everything properly. Um, and then, um, so yeah, any of that stuff, AdWords, uh, you know, on, on Google, um, LinkedIn, depending on if you're selling B2B or whatnot. So uh, that would be good. Then you can get into more like active stuff where you're, um, you're active on, um, you're active in Facebook groups, you're active in real life um, communities where you're, you know, B and I like kind of the networking sort of stuff. I'm not a huge fan of that stuff because it's usually just everybody trying to sell to each other. But I know some people who've been very successful and it hasn't worked for me, but um, that's another route that people do. Um, cold calling, again, for the right strategy or with the right product and you're calling and you know who you're calling and you're tracking all of your time and activity to determine, you know, you know Tom Black, of course, knows all this stuff to determine um, that your target, you're, you're properly reaching your target uh, decision maker and all that's working. Um, so if you want the cold call route, let's see what else people do. PR, PR is way underutilized in my opinion. Um, I love PR because if you can if you can take your business, which is kind of doing some sort of, um, it doesn't matter what you do, and you can tie it to some sort of activity that's like out in the world that's interesting to people and that's topical maybe, then you're then that's all free free advertising basically if you can get if you can get good PR campaigns running so if you're um, somewhat creative as far as writing uh, or you know somebody or can pay for somebody to do your press releases and then you get that out to your you know local um, you start out local anyway to your local media people that's a, and they're always looking for stuff if you have good pictures and kind of a good story then it's pretty easy to get PR done and I would recommend that for everybody to think about their business and how they can connect it to their local media market um, we've done that very successfully in a number of businesses and it's it's always kind of a slam dunk as far as because then you don't really have any cost right if you can get other people to talk about you then uh, and, or, or to tell your story for you it does two things it creates credibility and it also um, it's also free impressions that you're not really paying for after your initial effort of getting the story out there. So um, PR is a great way to generate um, lead and um, kind of brand out in the community. Um, I think that's it off the top of my head. Cold calls, PR, um, networking, affiliate networking. That's a good a good one if you can build a if you can build a model that it, that includes affiliates. Like where other people can make money off of your 
platform. So they really are all they have to do is, you know, drive the business and then you, they make money and you do all the work. Like, you know, so that applies to 